Well, today we uh, wrap up a series uh, out of John 6, all around the words of Jesus when he said, I am the bread of life. We're going to kind of bring that home today as we come to communion. Think of it almost as a sort of a landing in that, uh, that place, in communion, sort of a, almost a communion um, devotion as we uh, just kind of remind ourselves what we're doing and the possibility that we're coming to when we come to the bread and to the cup. Uh, and then next week we start a new series that I'm really excited about called the Kindness Challenge, which is very practical. We're giving kind of we're kind of accepting the challenge together, and then we're going to spend the month learning about what that that really means—the power of kindness, which is more than just being nice, has to do with God's decision to treat us a certain way, to love us in a committed way, and compassionate, merciful, and kind way, and then our choice, uh, potential choice. To do the same. And the key in that, uh, not to get ahead of ourselves, is like it doesn't really matter how we act. God has decided to act a certain way to us, and that's how we choose kindness. It doesn't really matter how other people are going to act or react or not uh, respond or respond. It's, it's our choice, and we're going to choose that together. So uh, if you didn't get this when you came in, get it when you, got out, when you go out. Um, and it is not a bingo card. It is uh, our kindness challenge. But you can use it like one if you want and kind of do it in whatever order you want. There aren't dates on these. But through September, we will be engaging in intentional acts of kindness together. Uh, and if you ordered a shirt, this is Choose Kindness. That'll be here next week. And we have invited our community partners and conversation across the community, including with uh, the city of Bowling Green and uh, the neighborhood um, kind of initiatives uh, in, in our city. So really, there's going to be a lot to this, and we're excited about it. I think there might even be an official designated day uh, uh, that the, the city designates. So uh, stay tuned for that. But as you go, uh, if you will accept the challenge, then we have a parting gift, and that is a sticker. In all seriousness, this is a chance for you to say yes to the challenge, and then to place that somewhere where you need to be reminded to, to use the power of kindness. You might put it on the dashboard of your car, you might, might put it on a family member, whatever it kind of takes <laughs> to remind you of the power of kindness. Okay. Our scripture reading is once again, uh, and for the fourth, uh, time, fourth Sunday in a row, finally, uh, wrapping up in John 6, starting with verse 51 and then verses 60 through 69. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, Jesus said. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, there are more verses that follow in which they sort of have a hard time with this. And then uh, in verse 60, we pick it up again. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Sort of, then you haven't seen anything yet. Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to, to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back. And no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. And may God add the blessing uh, to his blessing to the reading of the word for sure, because we need it. And we need to hear those words of life and understand what God is offering us. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life as a way of making a connection to something that we understand. We all get hungry. We know what it's like to feel that need for physical bread. That same hunger is in all of us. And what if we relied on God the same way we relied on that bread? What if we were able to renew our trust in God every day as he provided for our needs. What would it look like to rely on God spiritually the same way we do rely on bread physically? 
to discover that we don't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And to, to do that in a way that, you know, is pretty ordinary. Bread is basic, right? It is, it is sort of in the ordinariness of life that we are expecting and renewing our faith that God would show up. And that maybe is the hard part. We're going to see that as this goes along, people have trouble hanging with Jesus. Even Jesus had people walk away from him so much that he had to turn to his disciples and say, you're not going to, are you? And I wonder what the struggle is there as we hear Jesus say what they say, man, this is a tough teaching. Could it be that we have trouble believing, simply trusting in what Jesus is offering? That, that in the ordinariness of life, there might also be the possibility for holiness. That we might, through those very points of need, either learn to trust God and, and so grow through that trust, or grumble, and we heard that word, didn't we? The disciples were grumbling. It is a, it's a catchphrase. It, it, ca it harkens back to the Exodus story, which has been the undercurrent of all of John 6, because this was the other place where God provided daily bread. It was on the journey from uh, Egypt to the Promised Land in the Exodus story. Each day is a chance for them to wake up and go out and check through the tent flap. Is the bread there? The manna in the wilderness, the bread that they have to go back to each day. They go to bed and wonder, hmm, will we have enough for tomorrow when we wake up in the morning? And they go and check again. And that daily rhythm of having to go and see if God provided taught them something, didn't it? It taught them that God can be trusted and it's not just about providing food. It's also pro providing everything. It's not just God sustaining their physical life, but God taking them on the, the journey of salvation itself, the journey to their own liberation, to be God's special people called to be a blessing to the world. But that kind of daily trust isn't easy. And so they grumbled. They grumbled a lot. Every little test became a challenge to that trust. Every point along the way, so much so that many of them didn't see it all the way through, did they? That first generation of those taken out of Egypt, very few got to see the promised land. It's a little bit of a hard edge to an otherwise happy ending. Trust is hard. Even Jesus had this experience. Jesus had started out pretty popular. John 6 starts with Jesus feeding 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch, and the crowds go wild. It's like a fan experience. They're chasing Jesus around the Sea of Galilee, trying to see where he's going to be next, going like people would uh, to a concert, kind of crazed at the spectacle. But here, just some, uh, the end of the chapter, 50 verses later or so, we find so many have left that he's talking to his disciples about whether they were going to leave too. Jesus wasn't saying what the crowds wanted to hear. They wanted a leader like Moses who would rise up and take control. But Jesus doesn't take the part of Moses in the Exodus story. What does he do? He takes on the role of the bread, of the, of the offering, of that daily trust that's learned through God's giving. In 651, he says, I am the living bread. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, just like the manna. Whoever eats this bread, though, will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. This is a tough teaching, his disciples said. Did you notice it wasn't just the crowds now that are struggling? It was those who had previously said yes, those who were following but the early church would look back at this moment as the key to understanding really what Jesus was ultimately about, who he was and what he was going to do. Jesus was the bread of life sent from heaven. He was the one who would give his life away for the life of the world. We call this a divine exchange. Sometimes we say the one who was whole became broken so that we who are broken could be made whole. John understood this offering as the key to everything else. 
this exchange of the fullness of life that God offers into our ordinary lives. And so since the time of Jesus, ordinary bread has been a symbol of that. For us, the bread is not just bread. It is a a sign or a symbol, an outward and visible sign of an inward grace, a means of grace, a way of keeping two things together, our humanness and God's holiness, and discovering that God is bringing those together in us. There's mystery to this. The Greek word that the early church used for sacrament was mysterion, translated mystery. God is doing something bigger than just giving us bread. There's something powerful that we can't fully explain happening when we come. There's mystery. Our communion liturgy begins and ends giving thanks to God for letting us into this mysterious thing. We rehearse the story of salvation and then we give thanks as we come humbly to receive yet again. You know, um, at, after communion, a lot of times the servers will gather and will pray. And I wonder if those of you who are, you know, kind of watching that, like wonder, well, like, what do they say there? Is that like the special, like insider kind of language or the special handshake? What do they say? I often pray the end of the, the communion liturgy in those moments together. Uh, some version of this gracious God would give thanks for this holy mystery in which you give yourself so fully to us. Now may we give ourselves in that same way fully to your world in acts of love and compassion and service. The Latin word for what we do in a sacrament is sacramentum. It's where we get our word for sacrament and it means vow or promise. When Jesus said, I am the bread of life, he's making us a promise, an offering of himself fully. And then the bread becomes a reminder of that. It's a tangible thing to get at something pretty intangible. So Holy Communion is that reminder to keep offering ourselves to what God has already offered. It is our sustaining sacrament. We come again and again with our hands outstretched to the thing that only God can provide, the thing that we believe Jesus can do. It is our sustaining sacrament. When... um, when my son was training uh, to, to be a swimmer early on, uh, as he got older and he got more serious, uh, he took um, his eating pretty seriously. But early on, uh, as a teenager, a 12 or 13 year old, he ate a lot of junk food. And so I uh, pulled him aside uh, one time and said, if you're going to reach your goals, you know, if you want to go to Olympic trials, you're going to have to eat better. You know, you can't, you can't eat junk. And he sort of looked at me and he's like, dad, you don't know what you're talking about. I, I got used to that look, by the way. Um, <laughs> but he was able to detect it. Uh, So I tried to find an analogy that helped him. And so one time I said, you know, um, think about those race cars that we see on TV. Like, they can't just put regular cheap gas in those cars. They're not built for that. Now, if they just wanted to drive the car around, you know, town a little bit, and that that would be fine. But if they want a high-performance vehicle, they have to use high-performance fuel. And so it's the same with you. You You gotta put good fuel in your body. And he kind of looked at me like, yeah, whatever. You know, so it was, I thought it was great. I thought it was a really good analogy. And so we make the same analogy here. If, we, if our goal is just ordinariness, then regular bread will do. But if it's holiness, then we're going to need special fuel. We're going to need the bread of life. And that's the distinction here. I think that's the call up and, the, and really the, the parting of ways between those who say, oh, this is too tough and kind of drift away or those who come to Jesus and say, well, there's really nowhere else to go because you have the very words of life. Communion is our fuel that sustains us on the journey to salvation. It is our reminder to come to the thing that God offers. It is learning to live every day, making the connection between the human and the holy. Otherwise, well, we forget, don't we? We drift, or we settle. We go about our daily lives with blinders on to the holy and just see what is right in front of us. We fail to grow in our love for God and neighbor. 
We fail to renew our trust in God doing something more than we might expect. We give up on the possibility of being transformed into those who can actually love God and love neighbor as a living reminder of Jesus in this world. This is the choice, the distinction, the call. Earth is crammed with heaven, Elizabeth Barrett Browning says, and every common bush afire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest of us sit around and pluck blackberries. Richard Rohr writes, one great idea of the biblical revelation is that God is manifest in the ordinary, in the actual, in the daily, in the now, in the concrete incarnations of our lives. Our experiences of ordinary life will transform us if we are willing to experience them fully. We call that communion. This is quite different than much of religion's emphasis on being pure and perfect or finding the correct way to God. Jesus turns all of that on his head, offering himself as the bread that sustains us on the journey to our own salvation. Hmm. Robert Brown Taylor writes, there is no spiritual treasure to be found apart from the bodily experiences of human life on earth. No way of knowing God apart from real life in the real world. No distinction between the sacred and the secular, the physical and the spiritual body and soul. That in our quest for spiritual things, most of us go looking for that somewhere other than our ordinary lives right where we are. That on the spiritual treasure map, most of us can't see the big red X that marks the spot because we're already standing on it. Maybe this is the hardest teaching to accept. To stay right where we are and to offer ourselves yet again to the one who offers himself so fully to us. Maybe it would be easier to just pick the blackberries. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. As we kind of come to the end of this series and into the end of this sermon, there are two parts of that statement of faith that I think are helpful for those of us who want to kind of offer ourselves to receive the bread of life. One is uh, there's a hint in what Jesus has already said. I mentioned in the, the, earlier in the sermon that man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That word, word, comes up twice in this passage. Jesus himself says it, the words that I've spoken to you are full of spirit and of life. And uh, we're reminded there that that word life isn't just biological life. At some point, a couple, a couple weeks ago, I said there are two words for life. One is biology kind of life. And the other is life and life to the full. And the understanding was that God's word was that. That in fact, the creation itself came into existence at God's word. God spoke and everything that is sprang into existence. So the creativity and the possibility and the promise come through God's word that has life. And so that's what Peter gives witness to. But you catch it, it's almost like he said, well, you know, we've considered all the other options, but where else would we go? You have the words that are full of life, that lead to life to the full. God's word that sustains us, not just for physical life, but to make us fully alive. The other hand is in that word believe. We have come to believe and to know, he says. Believe here and, and in really anywhere in John should always be understood not a, a believe that, but a believe in. It's, it's a relational word. In fact, you could easily translate it trust. We have come to trust. We have come to to believe that you are the source. We have woken up and prayed yet again, give us this day our daily bread. And we believe you are the one who gives it. Which brings us to communion, why we do it. 
so that we can bring ourselves to that point of trust over and over and over again. It is our sustaining sacrament. Baptism is a once and, once and for all, one and done kind of thing because God's grace is that, it's once and for all. But communion is our sustaining sacrament. We come to it again and again to remind ourselves to keep receiving what Jesus alone can bring. And there are three little stories that help me as I think about what we're doing when we come to communion over the years, so some things that have sort of stuck with me. The first is uh, from my good friend, Len DeVazor, who I talk to every Friday. His mother, Karen, was, a, was a, a United Methodist pastor, and she passed away a few years ago. But her deal, I mean, like every single time she uh, led us in communion, her deal was that you needed to take enough bread to know you had some, Right? Uh, and so the amount mattered. It was, a, it was really about abundance. And so I th and honestly, if you've ever been where, uh, where maybe you take communion and you break the bread off yourself, uh, we don't do it that way anymore, but you know, we used to, like take a piece of bread. What people would do is they'd get an itty bitty little piece and then they would dip it into the cup and like get more finger in the, the juice than actual bread. No, grace is abundant. You may not feel worthy of any more than that little piece, but that's the point. Come ready to receive. Get you some bread so that you know you got some. Hmm. Another story that I think of is one time when I was receiving communion, uh, and um, it was, it's been 25 or 30 years ago, but it was when I think maybe the first time where communion made sense to me. I was watching someone else serve and there were a couple stations like we do here and someone was handing the bread like we do here. And I, I just couldn't help, but I couldn't take my eyes off that communion server because every time she gave the bread to every single person without exception, looking them in the eye, it was like she was giving them a million dollars every time. Like the greatest, get more than that. The greatest gift that she could possibly give and I remember thinking to myself, Lord, help me if I ever give communion in a way other than that. And Lord, help me to every time receive it like that. What a gift. But my favorite communion story, I think, applies mostly today. It is from my early in my ministry at Patronville United Methodist Church. And um, it was the first church that I had where I was the solo pastor. And we populated it basically with my family. So, um, you know, they had to love me. Uh, so the, the, about half the church was family on both sides, my mom's and my dad's. And my first cousin, Faith, um, had a little boy who is a full-grown man now and is a remarkable human being and very calm. His name is Thomas. But as a child, he was a remarkable human being that was not very calm. You know, like how sometimes a kid can be like one extreme and they kind of get it all out of themselves. And whoo, buddy, he was, uh, he was just buck wild. I remember uh, like events, like at my family events at my grandpa's house, when Thomas was little bitty, they would set him loose and he would run a circle, this lap through my grandpa's kitchen, around to the living room, into the dining room and back again. And we could be there four or five hours and he, the kid's just going. We're like, is, that, is he right? You know, like he just kept going in circles. He just had energy to burn. We'd set him down and he'd do a thing. And four or five later, hours later, she'd pick him up and like, you know. So all that to say, they were coming to communion. And uh, Thomas was in front, probably seven or eight years old. And Faith was behind him. As I saw them come, I could just see in Faith's eyes, just like, whew, it, it's exhausting. Right? And that's part of, you know, why we come, right? We, we have need. Parenting's not easy. But Thomas was in front, and Th Thomas was wild-eyed and ready to go and so excited. Uh, and so I'll never forget, he took the bread and then dipped it into the cup, and then he ate it, and then just looked me square in the eye and said, you know what, I think I'll have another. And I've told that story for years, and every time I tell it, I think I get it a little bit more. Where else would we go? You alone have the words of life. So I think I'll have another. It is the abundance of God's grace that keeps offering us something that we might not even 
really be willing to think is possible for ourselves. This trust that is a daily trust of just coming back and just keep coming. Keep receiving. Keep renewing your trust in the thing that Jesus alone offers. This trust that is the daily trust of those who wake up each morning and wonder if there's enough for this day too and find that there is as God takes us out of slavery and into liberation, out of fear and into salvation on the journey to the promised land. And not just some people, but ordinary people like us. Ordinary saints who just keep coming back for the bread. Let us pray. Jesus, we give thanks that you gave yourself to us this way. We confess, and, and, and I think you know already, that we're just needy people. We're so grateful that you said you would just you would meet that need. There's, that's, there's nothing to it. There's no discussion. And not just for our spiritual hunger, but for our, our deepest spiritual hunger. And not just in a small way, but you gave yourself fully with just, with no reservation You who were full became empty so that we who are empty could be made full, filled up and overflowing. So we humbly pray that you would meet us here again in the ordinariness of our lives with your exquisite holiness symbolized in something so simple regular bread that reminds us that there is also the bread of life itself that you are offering to us now. So renew our trust as we come. Renew our faith on the journey toward our liberation and for the liberation of the whole world through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the bread of life. Amen.